Good morning. Man, that was a whole lot of cuteness up here, I tell you. So it's, uh, now you have me. It's all downhill from here. But I do have a picture of my family, so that'll add a little bit of brightness uh, to the day if we have that on there. So uh, my name is Bob Abel, and I've been a pastor in the Reformed Church for about 15 years. And I'm going to share a little bit about our story this morning, but I want to introduce our family. There's, there's three seasons in the fall here in Wisconsin. Of course, there's football season, and we were very excited about that yesterday. We're still holding our breath about this evening. And and there's deer hunting season, and there's cold and flu season. So that's the season that my family is in this morning. So they weren't able to visit today, but but they'll be all right. So um, this is my, the little one is my son Judah, and our older son Josiah, and then my wife Amy, and um, a daughter we adopted in our heart in Thailand, so her name is Nice. Smile Nice is her nickname, and she, she certainly does. So I just want to share a little bit about our journey this morning. I thank you, uh, family here, for your support, your encouragement, your affirmation. Some of you may be not even aware of that to, to get us to this point today, but all part of the Lord's work in bringing us to this point. I grew up on a little farm town in central Wisconsin, and I thought that I didn't want to get up and milk cows for the rest of my life. So, um, you know, somehow I had this illusion that something else might be easier. I'm not so sure. But I went into business. I worked at Kohler Company for 14 years. And it was at that time that I felt the Lord calling me into pastoral ministry. And so we, we started in our role at Bethany Reformed Church in Sheboygan. I served there as youth pastor for five years, went to seminary in Michigan. And then we planted a church in Sheboygan, and we did that for seven years, and we cried out to the Lord as well. We cried out for financial provision, we cried out for leaders, we cried out for teachers, and the Lord provided those things, and I thought, this is the point where we're going to sit back and say, thank you, Lord, and then he said, nope, now I've got something else for you to do, and I want you to walk away from all that and do something else, and after a little bit of time, maybe a lot of time arguing with him, this is where we're at today. I want to share that we're going to be talking about a topic that's, that's tough and that's difficult this morning. I want to share that we're going to be talking about a topic that is, uh, in many ways, um, mature. And so I know there's a lot of parents here, a lot of children here, and I just want to let you, you know that. I'll be sensitive to that. We'll be showing a video later that'll speak a little bit into that. My children have seen it many times, but of course we've had the opportunity to sit and discuss that. And so if that's not something you want to do this morning, you're not going to offend me if you want to if you feel at any point that you want to stand up and, and walk out for a moment, I want to be sensitive to that. So the Lord called us to work uh, at a ministry that prevents the human trafficking of children around the world. And he called us to, to leave and to move from southeast Wisconsin to, to Thailand. And then he called us back. And we're still wrestling with that. So he took us on this journey, and that's what I'd like to share about. But first, let's Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for, as we heard in the promises of baptism and in the promises of your word that you always hear when we cry out. And sometimes when our spirits just cry out, and we don't even know what to say or who to go to, you hear and you go before us. And so may these stories today, as difficult as what they are, as hard as what the world is sometimes, because you did promise Jesus that in this world we would have trouble. But you also said, but take heart because I've overcome the world. And so may we today, may we be filled with hope, the hope of the promises of baptism, the hope of gathering together such a beautiful family of God gathered together. May we find hope in your word that it's still alive today and speaking to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I wonder if you might journey with me this morning. I'll show you a picture. Journey with me down a a dirt road in a severely impoverished country. 98% of the population is Buddhist there. And it was on this road about eight years ago that the, the Lord dropped a question on me that I didn't really know how to respond to. I didn't expect to. I was on a missions trip with my older daughter, and we found ourselves in Southeast Asia, and I was thinking this was all going to be about our relationship with the Lord. I didn't think this was going to be about me, and he dropped this question, which was, why you? Why me? 
So why was I born here in, in Wisconsin, in, in America? Why was I born in a place where I had an opportunity for loving parents, for an education, for churches in, in, in every community, Christian churches, sometimes on every corner of every community? Why was I so blessed to be able to have heard the gospel, to respond to that, and then find myself serving the Lord in His kingdom work? Why was I so blessed? Why wasn't I born here? Why wasn't I born in a little wooden shack home alongside of a dirt road where, where I might go to my grave without ever hearing the name Jesus and being able to respond? Why was I so blessed? And halfway around the world, what was I supposed to do with that? It was here on this trip that our family first got its exposure to atrocity that's in, going on in the world right now of human trafficking, the human trafficking of children. I'll put some statistics for you to see. It's beyond comprehension what's happening, but there is hope. You know, I talked about it being football season in the Camp Randall Stadium yesterday. I don't know, what does that hold? 80,000 fans? Imagine, imagine that stadium being filled every three weeks with children who are sold for the first time, repeatedly, over and over and over again. This is what's happening. And so the question was, why, why me? Why was I born here where we didn't have to live in that every day? Why wasn't I born there? Why was I so blessed why was I born in a place where I was seen as a soul to be nurtured rather than a commodity to be sold? Why was I so blessed? And what were we supposed to do with that? I wonder if you might journey with me in your mind to a refugee slum in Cambodia. It's home to thousands of Vietnamese refugees along a river Maybe you can even get that sense of what that place might smell like and look like. And it's here that I want to introduce you to Nu. And on this next slide, she's the, the tall young girl singing in church, in worship. She gave her heart to the Lord when she was seven years old. But this is a story of when she cried out to the Lord at the most horrific time in her life, when her grandmother sold her for the first time. She's going to speak in her story about a man named Carl and his wife, Lori. People just like you and I that grew up in the, the Midwest, but, but heard the cry and answered that cry and went to look for her. So let's share her story now. I would like to share my story. I remember I was seven years old near my house was Vietnam Beacher. Because the school was in church, I had to ask my grandmother if I could go there. She allowed me to go. My teacher helped me to study Bible every day. And then I believed in Jesus and became a Christian. Then I went to church every week. I would clean the church each week before it started. When I was 12 years old, I remember my family had very difficult life because my family did not have work. My grandmother had to borrow the money. She borrowed the money to buy food for my family. She had to pay high interest every day on the money she borrowed. One day, I saw the lady talking with my grandmother when I came back from school. My grandmother told me I might stop going to school. When she said that, I knew I might be so. So I start to pray. I told God I was very scared and I did not know what they would want me to do. Three days later, the lady took me to the doctor to make sure I was virgin. Then the lady took me to the man. I was 12 years old. He was in hotel room, and I had to stay with him for three days. 
I knew I had to do everything the man wanted me to do. Before the man did everything to me, I said, please do not do this to me. I cried out of God, asking him, help me not be hurt. During those three days, I could not eat or drink anything. I never went to sleep. The first night, I was crying and I was sending all of my sin in my life, including sleeping with the man. At the time, I believed God did not love me anymore because of my sin. I had lost all hope. At the end of three days, the lady picked me up and took me back to my house. I was giving some aspirin for my friend, but did not see the doctor. I stayed in pain for two weeks. My life changed a lot. I was very sad. I did not want to eat or talk to anyone. I could no longer smile out. At that night, I would cry and ask God, why did you? Make me have this pain. Why did you break my heart? If I did not know you, I could understand. But I know you. I love you. I follow you. I talk with you. I do everything for you. But since this happened to me, please let me be the last girl this happened to. After about two weeks, my teacher Zhang convinced me to come by school and church. During the next six months, I learned that my friend at school talking about me. They swear, spelling people I was so, so I quit going to school. During those six months, I was so, so two more time. I was very scared. I could be so to proto, so I asked my grandmother to let me go to hair and nail school. After asking for seven months, my grandmother finally said yes. But because I did not have enough money, I had to clean the school to study hair and nail. After one year of school, I start working 12 hours each day with two days of each month. I was 14 years old. Now I know that the same time I start going to hair and nail school, God's spot remember you to my dad's heart. I learned many people were praying for me during this time. I learned that my dad came to Cambodia six times during this time to try and find me. Then in July 2006, we met the first time. He told me how God's spot remember you to his heart and how God won him and Lori help me. Then in September 2006, I became the worker of remember you. I start to teach the older girls in children home how to do it hair and nails. God done so many amazing things and so me so much love. Jesus giving me new parents in Carol and Lori. He taking me to Thailand, the Philippines, and now America. What I remember you. Jesus have answered my prayer by using me to help prevent children from entering the sixth grade. Thank you for allowing me to share my story. It's a challenging in your heart, in your gut, but there's hope. There's hope because we have a risen Lord. If I could show the next picture that we have. The picture of the woman in the wedding dress is new. Last year, last May, on her wedding day, 
And what a, what a gospel story. What a, what a story of redemption and rescue that on that day, she was able to give herself to the, to the man that God had chosen for her rather than the one that evil had chosen. And she was able to give herself willingly. In the picture next to her, there's an elderly Asian woman looking at photos on a cell phone, and she's looking at photos of New's wedding. That happens to be New's grandmother. New's grandmother still lives in Cambodia in the same house that she sold New out of, but because of the forgiveness and the love that New showed her, and because of the gospel and the grace that Christ pours out upon us, her grandmother received Christ and is a Christian. And not only that, she has young girls living in her home, the very same home that she sold new out of. She has young girls living there that she prevents from being sold into the trade. It's that rescue story of the cross. There's no one, there's no situation that's too far gone from God's forgiveness, from his grace, from his love, from his restoration. And it was her prayer, it was news prayer, that she would be the last girl that this would happen to. And that's the reason that, that I'm up here today. And that's the reason that my family moved halfway around the world. It's to fight this, this issue, this atrocity of human trafficking in, in our world. To prevent children from being sold and allow them just to be kids like we saw this morning. See, because it began not on that, that dirt road that I was walking along, and it didn't even begin in the story at that most horrific time during the news life. This really began when, when you and I, when we cried out, when we knew that we needed a Savior, when we knew that we needed rescuing, and we cried out for, for forgiveness and for God's mercy and His grace, and He heard our cry and He answered us. That's, that's when this began. I want to go to a story we love so much in the book of Exodus. Exodus 3, starting with, with verse 7. And here, in this story, God's chosen people, the ones that he pulled out and were going to set apart so that they could be seen. This is what it looks like to live with the one true God. But these people found themselves in slavery for 400 years, and they cried out. And the Lord heard their cry, and he talked to a man named Moses. And starting with verse 7, it says, the Lord says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering, so I have come down to rescue them. I've come down to rescue them. I've heard their cries. I've seen their misery. See, because the Lord, as we heard earlier, the Lord always hears our cries. He always hears our cries. In a world where there are those that don't seem to have a voice, where there are those that we, that we don't even think about because our day just goes on and on and on, some that seem so far away, the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner were here in Scripture. God's saying time and time again, these are the ones that I sent you out to reach with the good news. In the book of James, in James chapter 1, starting with verse 27, he says the only religion, the only way of doing church that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by this world. So why them? Why the orphan? Why the widow? Why the foreigner? They're the ones that are so easily oppressed. The ones that seem to be weak in this world. The ones that so often don't seem to have a voice. Does anyone hear their cry? The Lord always hears their cry. He always hears the cry. It was at the end of the Old Testament. God's chosen people were set up as the greatest nation the world had ever known, but they went their own way. They found themselves in slavery once again, and they were taken into exile. And in Psalm 137, 1, it says, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion, when we remembered our freedom, when we remembered what it was like. We cried out. They cried out for freedom. And guess what? The Lord heard their cry. We're going to celebrate it in a few weeks. It's Christmas, it's Emmanuel, it's God come to live with us. And in our Bibles, we can just flip the page and there he is. He shows up, he once again hears the cries. And one of Jesus' first sermons is this, it's in Luke 4, starting with verse 18. He says, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I've come to preach the good news, Jesus said, to set the slave free. Because he always hears our cries. 
He always hears our cries. And he heard news cry. How powerful was that cry? Well, it was heard 10 years later by a middle-aged pastor halfway around the world. That was one way that it was so powerful. We're the body of Christ. I wish you could see what I see this morning. This is beautiful body of Christ here in Alto. And we have been saved not just from something, but we've been saved to something. We've been saved with a purpose to preach good news to the poor and to set the captives free. That's worth our thanksgiving. So why were we born here? Why were we born in a place where we have freedom, where we have economic blessing, where we have educational opportunities, where we have a Christian advantage? And I believe it's so that we have all that we need physically, emotionally, and spiritually to take the good news of Christ to the end of the road or, or to the ends of the world. It gets even better. There's more hope. Here's what the Lord has done in just a little over 10 years through the Remember New Ministry that we serve. Now, on average, uh, the founder of the ministry, Carl, uh, did his master's thesis on children's homes, and he found out that it took, on average, 12 years to start a children's home. One children's home from the time of conception to funding to building or leasing and, and having parent, house parents in there, staff, for about 35 children. But in just over 10 years, Remember New has 80 homes with, in 15 countries. It's even updated since the last slide with over 1,800 children. But that's, that's nothing. See, because that cry was too small. That cry was about freedom in this world. But Jesus says, I come to give you freedom for eternity. And in Thailand, as an example, missionaries have been there over 100 years and there is less than 1% professing Christian in that country. 100 years! So every time if your outreach committee gets together and you're feeling a little frustrated, you can go back to that story. 100 years, less than 1%. Now the Remember New Children's Homes, they identify through relationships in these countries, children that are at risk of being sold, and they offer them a scholarship to come live in that home where their physical, their emotional, their spiritual, and their educational needs are met through a sponsorship. But they're never forced to believe anything. It's a Christian organization. It's a Christian home. But the kids are living in a submissive culture. And so if you said you should be Buddhist, they'd say, okay, I'm Buddhist. Or you should be Hindu. Okay, I'm Hindu. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a heart conversion. So the, the house parents and the staff, they simply love with the agape love of Christ. And they share through Bible studies, through worship that the older kids lead for the younger kids on Sundays, and they share. 90% of children in a remember, no, a remember New Home come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And they, they make profession of faith. They ask to be baptized. And they're not just renouncing the, the sin of this world, they're renouncing hundreds of years of culture and history in their families because of the good news of Christ. Because of the good news of Christ. And now they're going back to their villages and into their colleges and into their schools and they're sharing the gospel. It's an amazing thing. What, the, what Satan intended for evil, he thought he was going to take these kids out. The Lord is using for good. And now the Lord is using them to take him out. And I believe they're going to be a transforming generation of, of these nations. And, and, and the hard truth of the matter is that unless these children were at risk of, of being sold for their bodies, they may never have heard the good news. Those that were vulnerable and without a voice are now loud and they're strong. And we can be a part of that. We get to be a, you are a part of that by being a part and supporting and encouraging our ministry. And this is typically where the sermon would end. I talked to Pastor Kevin. He said, keep going. So I said, okay. But this is where the sermon would end, where we get to a point where we would read the Scripture and, and it would say, I have indeed heard the cries of my people. And the Lord always hears our cries. And, and He'd send us out to preach good news to the poor. And, and we'd know that. And, and we'd get fired up about that. And, and those are the Scriptures that, that, 
caused us to, to move around the world and, and to give it all away. Those are the scriptures that spoke to my heart in April of 2016 when we said yes to this, that spoke to my wife's heart even before that and led her to say yes. That led our family, again, to leave home and, and church and family and the only way we were only, all we knew was Wisconsin, to move halfway around the world to serve these children. And I love those scriptures. Those are great. But I've also come across another scripture that I realized maybe I don't love quite so much. It's also in Luke chapter 14, beginning with verse 28, where he says, suppose, Jesus says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build but wasn't able to finish. Jesus says, when you follow me, you need to count the cost. Count the cost to saying yes. And while it's, it's expensive to move to Thailand, but the Lord was faithful, and just in seven months we raised the support we needed to, to go there, and we moved into a nice home, and we were able to purchase a vehicle and, and settle in as our roles of as missionaries serving in Thailand. Because the Lord is faithful, right? And the Lord always hears our cries. We moved in January just this past year. And we were sad, but we were excited. There was culture shock, but the, but the Lord provided friends. There was loneliness, but the Lord blessed us with a new family. Hundreds of Thai children with smiles just like we saw this morning up here. There was unsettledness, but there was a blessing of a new country to explore. But then our 10-year-old began to experience severe migraines and stomach issues. And for the last month we were there, didn't really feel like doing anything but lying on the couch all day. And then the very real spiritual oppression of living in a Buddhist and animistic culture right in our neighborhood where the monks would come by on 6.30 on Sunday mornings and bang a gong outside of our window and do worship. I think they knew we were Christian. But then that began to take a weight spiritually and emotionally on us. Then my wife Amy began to experience panic attacks. We didn't know what that was. Physically, emotionally, we didn't know what was going on. Then, at that time, I was into about my six months of insomnia, where I hadn't slept more than a few hours a night. But the Lord is faithful, right? And he hears our cries. And, and, and this is the truth that I know, but the reality I see is that my family is just crumbling all around me, and I don't know what we're supposed to do. How much do you sacrifice to say yes? How much is the cost, Lord? How much? Well, we left for Thailand on January 17th, 2017, filled with hope, with enthusiasm, with a kingdom purpose, with dreams for a future. And we returned a little over three months later, feeling empty and defeated and lost and, and worthless, wondering, could we ever be used again? How could we have gotten this so wrong? And would our family ever bounce back? This funny thing about feelings is that they can seem so real, but it doesn't make them true. And I would love to stand up here this morning and say that we've got it all figured out, and the Lord came and said, this is why you did this, and this is why you did this, and this is why I put you through this, but I don't. In fact, for, for a long time, for months, the Lord was silent when we cried out. We just wanted some type of answer. I wonder if you could journey with me along another road, this uh, a concrete sidewalk on a cold April morning in southeast Wisconsin. It was about a year after I had said yes to the Lord. And we were walking, I was walking and praying, and I, I didn't expect to hear from the Lord that day. He didn't owe me an explanation, but he, but he asked a question. And, and the question hit me just as clearly as that question on that dirt road. And he said, when are you going to quit feeling sorry for yourself and get off your butt and help these kids like I asked you to? Because I didn't tell you what it was going to look like. I just said, would you help? And you said yes, and they still need help. And that was the, the kick in the rear end that I needed 
to move forward, to see that I don't have to know. You know, God's plans are God's plans. They're not ours, and I would just mess it up anyway. He always hears the cries. And yes, there is a cost to saying yes, but the, ultimately the reward is far greater. The reward is far greater. So today we get to stand up here as missionaries in the RCA, serving Remember New. We get to, we're in the middle of raising our financial support, so we get to go around and speak at churches and share this good news of hope. Because if it isn't about us, it's, it's about the Lord, it's about his kingdom. We've come to learn during this time that we were over there struggling, that the, the Remember New uh, board and their leadership were, were praying because they thought that the need for our position, which is to serve kind of as a pastor to missionaries and get them ready to go and sustain them in the field and walk with them as they return, that this role would better be suited serving from the states to be able to get into all 15 countries rather than simply serving in Southeast Asia and Thailand. And that they were asking, thinking about asking us to return, but they, we had just gotten there. And they had actually been praying about this before we left, which my response to them was, you could have let me know. It might have been easier. You know, maybe in November you could have shared that with us. But we know that we needed to go there. We know that we needed to let go. Unless we were willing to let go of everything, then the Lord wasn't really going to be able to use us, whether it was in Thailand or here. We needed to let go so that we could hold on to what the Lord was giving us now. And had the ministry and the family been healthy in Thailand, uh, we wouldn't have had an urgency to return back to the role where the Lord needed us, back to where I believe our denomination needs us to be able to speak hope into these situations where we can make an effective difference, where we can be a part of this. Plus, it's warm in Thailand. It's not. I mean, I don't have to tell you that. So, but we came back. But however, through all this, we are in this moment, we believe that we are where the Lord wants us, where our family can flourish, and we're thankful, and we're just faithful. And the Lord said, don't worry about that. I'm going to take you different places, but right now you just need to be in Alto, Wisconsin this morning, and I'm thankful for that. Very, very thankful for that. So maybe the Lord might be inviting you personally to get involved in the ministry, and we would love to have you partner with us. And as a church, too, let's have this, this partnership See, I, I think of it like a river that's flooding. And, and the, the goal in, in this process of stopping the river is you've got some people that hold the sandbag and you've got some people that shovel the sand and they're passing it down and they're passing it down. And finally, one person takes that sandbag and he sets it on the river bank. But the goal and the mission of everyone in line is not to support that person putting the sandbag on the river bank. The mission of everyone in line is to stop the river from flooding. And we've got a river that's flooding. We've got kids that are being sold. 60, just while we're sitting here this morning. And so we're inviting you to get in line in some place. And there's so many ways from child sponsorship. Uh, here, I can put the next slide up. Support for, for us in our ministry. I don't have it up there. Support for our ministry. Child sponsorship. Trips to other countries to be able to do vacation Bible school for the children volunteer opportunities right here in the states to work with the ministry and be a liaison between sponsor families and the children's homes prayer ministry and so many other ways to be involved right here through this so we would love if you if the lord has laid on your heart we we part of our role is to help get you engaged into god's kingdom work if this is where the lord is leading you to come alongside of you as you come alongside of us it seems daunting. We see those numbers and we think of the topic and we think, how in the world can we do anything? But together, the Lord uses us because he's already heard the cry. He's already got a plan. He can take care of it all. And the beauty of it is, is he's inviting us to be a part of it and allow our lives to be transformed in its midst. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for hearing our cry. We thank you for hearing our, our cry when we're infants and we're crying out and our moms or dads come to our rescue. And we thank you that as we're walking through life and as we're, we're students and we're crying out about relationships or grades or decisions about our future, we're parents and we're crying out thinking, I don't know how to do this, Lord. It's 2 a.m. I haven't slept in three days. What? When we're crying out in our marriages saying, Lord, this is hard. 
or in, or in our faithfully serving in our church or sharing the good news with a neighbor down the road or someone standing next to us at our job. When we cry out to, your, to you, Lord, we are thankful that you've always heard our cry and you send grace and mercy and forgiveness and truth and truth. In a moment, Lord God, we're going to have an opportunity to return our tithes and offerings to you. It's a, it's a statement of faith, saying we believe. We believe that you're faithful to us. We believe that you always hear the cry. We believe everything we have comes from you, and we believe that you've invited us into a kingdom partnership where we can grow and this good news can be spread. We pray your blessing on the offering. We pray for those here and the leaders and the new deacons and new people on consistory that they would give, be given continued wisdom to steward well. We thank you this Thanksgiving season for loving us. Who are we that you would be mindful of us, but yet you know everything about us and you love us unconditionally. Thank you for that promise. Thank you for always hearing our cries. In Jesus' name, amen.